There we go. All right. I think it should be recording. Yes. yes. So um, let me now introduce this year's presenter of the Swanson Lecture in Christian Spirituality. Dr. Duane R. Bidwell is a faculty member at the Center for Health Professions Education, Bear School of Medicine, Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences of Maryland in the United States. He's an award-winning teacher and mentor, and Dr. Bidwell has served as a faculty member um, psychotherapist, nonprofit director, and clinical supervisor at the Center for Health uh, at the Center for Health Professions Education. He oversees a collaborative program with the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs to improve the leadership of clinical education in hospitals across the U.S. And from 2010 to 2022, he taught practical theology, spiritual care, and counseling at Claremont School of Theology, where he was co-director of the Center for Sexuality, Gender, and Religion, and senior staff clinician at the Clinbell Center for Pastoral Counseling and Psychotherapy. Dr. Bidwell has been involved in interfaith work since 1992 as a founding member of the Tarrant County, that's in Texas, Interfaith Council and the Texas Buddhist Council. He serves on the boards of the Society for Buddhist Christian Studies and the Taos Institute, an international educational organization that promotes relational approaches to education, organizational development and mental health. Uh, he advises the International Buddhist Chaplains Foundation. And Dr. Bidwell is a prolific author. His works have been featured on the CBC, CNN, and NPR. And his book, When One Religion Isn't Enough, The Lives of Spiritually Fluid People, uh, in, published in 2018 with Beacon, was a Christian century bestseller and library journal bestseller of 2018. And just a, a few uh, personal details, which I think are really fun is Dr. Bidwell, first of all, lives in Southern California, lucky Dr. Bidwell, with his wife, who's a curriculum editor. They have an adult son and participate in the life of Claremont Presbyterian Church. Dr. Bidwell volunteers as a fire, look at, fire lookout in the San Bernardino uh, Mountains and he hand builds pottery, which would be fun to watch, and enjoys hiking, rock climbing, and good food. And today, Dr. Dwayne Bidwell will be speaking on attending to spirit, spirituality, and childhood hope in chronic illness. Welcome, Dr. Bidwell. Thank you, Dr. Miyasek. Your that generous invitation or uh, introduction reminds me that my wife always says, my epitaph will read, he looked good on paper. So <laughs> it is good to be with you all. <laughs> I'm going to upload. Uh, if we could go ahead and start the slides, that would be great. And the next slide. So this is a photo I took of uh, San Antonio Falls, which is a waterfall at the base of Mount Baldy in the San Gabriel Mountains in Southern California. And those uh, pink and red things at the bottom are an offering that someone has left of flowers and fruit at the base of the falls. This is uh, a place of power for the indigenous peoples of the Los Angeles Basin. And I'd like to imagine that that offering I found that morning is an expression of gratitude. And as you'll see, gratitude and hope are very closely connected. And I also would like to uh, give my thanks to uh, Dean McNamara and uh, Dean Srivastava at the Faculty of Arts at the University of Calgary, to Dr. Cassis, the head of the Classics and Religion Department, to Dr. Music uh, and Judith Sims uh, also with the University for the invitation and the help uh, for having this lectureship happen, and, and to the Calgary Interfaith Council for co-sponsoring, particularly Sarah Arthurs, who spoke earlier, and Wallace Bornius and Dalton Harding, who were instrumental in getting uh, this event to happen today. Next slide. So, I am speaking to you from the unceded homeland of the Keats Nation, 
And this is a view of the Los Angeles Basin from the fire teller fire tower on Keller Peak, where I volunteer as a lookout. And I start this way, both to acknowledge the people who were here long before I was, but also to remind you that hope is rooted in specific times and specific places. Where we are and who we're with matters a lot to the nurture and sustenance of hope. So next slide. Hope is also rooted in specific people. And uh, for me, that is my wife, Carrie, and our son, Ben, here uh, at lunch in San Diego. So I remember them and I'm grateful for them for making my work possible in so many ways. So the next slide. So Christian scripture tells us to always be ready to give an answer when someone asks you about your hope, where it comes from, what it is, how you know it's there. So I'd like for you to just take a moment to bring to mind the people and the places, uh, the gifts of God, if you're a theist, uh, that ground your own hope. Who are those and where are those locations where your hope grows from? Next slide. And we could spend a lot of time talking about hope in general, but we're here to talk about hope among children with chronic illness. Uh, and not just any chronic illness, but end-stage renal disease. Uh, children whose broken kidneys require dialysis or organ transplant. So next slide. Kidneys uh, are a part of the human body, and they're essential for our life. They're one of our major organ systems. And, and what they do is they filter out uh, the bad stuff from our blood, uh, toxins, minerals, uh, water. They allow our blood and heart system to work together uh, to keep our bodies healthy. And the report I'm going to give you this afternoon uh, comes from a study of 51 children with end-stage renal disease. This means these are um, children whose kidneys have quit working completely, and they rely on dialysis or some other treatment to keep them alive. And we studied these children in dialysis units and transplant units uh, in three sites in the United States, the East, the South, and the West. So next slide. I want you to understand a little bit about the context these kids are in before we delve into their words. This photo is a typical pediatric dialysis unit and children come to the unit three days a week, usually for three hours at a time. It is incredibly boring. They just sit in a chair uh, and uh, let treatment happen to them. And it's very invasive. They have catheters and ports and surgeries. And all of these photos are pretty cleaned up. They look nice. Uh, so I, um, I want to apologize to those of you who are a little bit squeamish, but I also want you to have a sense of the unsanitized version of end-stage renal disease. So next slide. A child who's getting dialysis is attached to a machine and their blood, all of the blood in their body, cycles through the machine two to three times an hour, which means their body is drained and refilled six to nine times. And then they go to school. Some kids dialyze at home for 12 to 14 hours a night through a tube in their stomach. And there are lots of side effects to dialysis and medications. Uh, there are body image issues. There's lots of psychosocial suffering. So next slide. What did I learn from our research partners about hope? First, there are five practices that children say nurture hope uh, when they are sick. Uh, choosing trust, realizing connections, claiming power, maintaining identity, and attending to spirit. And today we're focused on that uh, pathway or practice called attending to spirit, a dimension of hope that's usually ignored by psychosocial theorists who are studying hope as a human experience. And hope is a resource, I'm sorry, uh, attending to spirit is a resource or practice, a skill children carry into the disease experience. And it, it happens on the existential um, continuum. Uh, there are other parts of hope that are more sociocultural. There are parts of hope 
that are a gift received from the disease itself. But today we're looking at this resource they bring into their illness experience that's connected to existential meaning. So next slide. You are going to hear me talk about normal a lot today, and I want to give you a, a warning about that word. Uh, when the children with end-stage renal disease talk about normal, it's, it is not a kind of uh, harmful norm in terms of I don't measure up. They use it as a kind of critical utopia, a sense of what could be. Uh, one of our participants said, I, I am normal, but I want to be more normal. So when you hear children use the word normal in what I'm about to present, that's the way they're using it as this vision of what's possible once they are healed or uh, free of the suffering of their illness. And next slide. There are two quotes I want to offer you to start with that give you a sense of the importance of attending to spirit in the midst of this illness. Ebony, who is a dialysis patient, says, without God, I really can't do it. It's a lot of burden on somebody my age. So next slide. And Grady, who's 15, a transplant recipient says, I talk to God like he's my friend. And so I just pray. And as you're about to see, prayer is a really important part of hope for children with this disease. So we can end the slides now. And uh, what I'm gonna offer this afternoon is less a lecture, uh, a scholarly lecture than an evocative reading. I want you to hear the voices of these children and how they understand spirit at work in their illness. So I invite you to listen to these stories and the interpretation I offer of attending to spirit as a hopeful practice. Twice in the same month, 13-year-old Roger got matched for a kidney transplant, and both times he hurried to the hospital with his parents, and both times doctors halted the surgery. The first kidney wasn't an optimal match. The second had an abnormality, but Roger says he wasn't disappointed. He didn't expect a transplant either time. At that time, he says, I didn't think that I'll get a kidney. I felt that it was not a good time or that it was not the time to get my kidney. Months later, Roger was jolted awake by a 3 a.m. phone call. It was the transplant coordinator from the hospital. And she said, Roger, we have a kidney for you. Can you come to the hospital? At this time, Roger had no doubt. I felt like hope, he says. Like I will get my kidney and that would be, it was going to be a good kidney for me. And it was. So I asked Roger why he was so confident that time. And this is what he said. Before I got my transplant, before, I always dreamed with God. I was dreaming with him, and I remember that he told me that. He showed me a kidney, like in my dreams. He showed me a kidney. He showed me a kidney, and he told me that was my kidney. And like a week later, they called me, like 3 a.m. in the morning. And I went, and I got my transplant. When I uh, first started to learn about hope and children, I was surprised by how few hope researchers mention religion and spirituality. People turn to spirituality during difficult times and positive religious coping leads to healthier and more effective responses to trauma and abuse and other negative experiences. But secular researchers, primarily in nursing and uh, psychology and education, seem to ignore the relationship between hope and spirit. Yet children reference religion and spirituality again and again when talking about hope. More than two-thirds of the young people in our study say attending to the presence and action of spirit helps them sustain hope. Connecting to spirit seems to be a skill and resource that sick children bring to chronic illness. It's cultivated long before diagnosis. And while children rarely volunteer this aspect of their experience to healthcare workers and other professionals, if you ask about it or follow up when they mention God, they engage 
eagerly. Take 12 year old Max, a transplant recipient. He told me that God used his ancestors to give him confidence when doctors had to remove, remove both of his kidneys. When they told me I was getting my kidneys taken out, Max says, I said, how can I live without kidneys? He was scared. But that night in his dreams, his deceased great-grandmother, a West African immigrant, came to him. My great-grandma, Max says, in the spirit, she's in my dreams talking to me. That's when I found out it would be okay. Max says God spoke through this grandmother. He told me, you are not going to die. He's going to be the one to take care of me, and I'm going to live. Don't worry. For children like Max, attending to spirit marks a shift in the way they sustain hope during illness. Right after diagnosis, they turn outward to realize connections with the medical team and to claim power in relation to treatment and the disease. But it doesn't take them long for, to learn that connections and power alone cannot sustain hope. No matter how many connections they make, there are times when they still feel alone. No matter how much power they claim, they cannot change or influence everything. In particular, the vision of normal that motivates them cannot be realized through their own efforts. Normal exceeds their capacity to create, and they begin to sense that they will always be abnormal to some degree. And at that point, many sick children respond by turning toward a transcendent source of affirmation, empowerment, and consolation. By attending to spirit, sick children sustain hope when human power isn't enough and normal remains beyond reach. So listen to 13-year-old Gina, who is a transplant patient. All kids have that one feeling that, you know, when you're there, it's just you want to smile or something, she says. You just want to be there, and you just get that nice, relaxed feeling, feeling relaxed all the time. God is always there for you, even when you don't think he's here. Now, in our study, girls and boys attend to spirit in equal measure, but the practice seems particularly important among Black and brown children. 85% of them name attending to spirit as a part of their hope, compared to 15% of white children. And this is consistent with data that indicates that Blacks and Latinos in the United States are more likely than whites to pray, to believe in God, and to say religion is important in their lives, as well as studies that suggest spiritual well-being plays a greater role in illness among Blacks and Latinos than among whites. So what does attending to spirit mean? I'm talking about the attitudes and actions that define a child's relationship to a transcendent goodness, however they understand it. Spirituality shapes a person's image of God or ultimate reality. It informs the way they pray, how they connect and attend to spirit, what they believe about serving others, and the importance they place on community. Attending to spirit, as Joan Chittister says, is the filter through which we view our worlds and the limits within which we operate. The ways that people talk about and express spirituality express a lot about their assumptions about ultimate reality, about what it means to be illness and the relationship between the two. And children with chronic illness describe consistent ideas about spirit, its characteristics, and its interactions with them and the world. They tend to focus on three things, faith, the nature of God, and prayer. So let's look at faith first. 14-year-old Riley started coughing a few days after her most recent birthday, and her parents thought she had a cold. But the cold didn't go away. Then she started throwing up as many as five times a day. Her parents took her to the emergency room and they learned that her kidneys had failed. Doctors admitted Riley to intensive care where she had a seizure. 
She stayed in intensive care for a month, undergoing chemotherapy to suppress her immune system to slow the attack on her kidneys. I was just like very scared, Riley remembers. I told my mom, like, I feel like dying. I feel like I'm going to die. But then she felt a presence in the intensive care unit. She and her mom saw a tall, beautiful angel in the corner of the room. The angel was praying and infusing Riley with healing energy. You could feel his presence, Riley remembers. It wasn't such a fabulous, great, exciting feeling, but it was calming. It was peaceful. And it was absolutely no fear. Now, six months later, Riley goes to the hospital four hours a day, three times a week for dialysis. And she says that God will keep her going no matter what, because she has a purpose. God didn't take me this far just to let me die, Riley says. God put me in this position so I can make a difference in people's lives, just a difference in their world. That's why I have so much faith in God. No matter what, it's like I'm going to make it through because it's there. He's got me. Riley and other children say hope depends on faith. Faith in God, in goodness, in others and impossibility. Now, this isn't a blind faith, a trust in something they've never seen or experienced. They validate and sustain their faith through concrete evidence that things can and do get better. Sick children point to positive laboratory results, rising energy levels, activities they can do again after treatment or maybe for the first time, and support from friends and family. They pay attention to tiny advances in health, attitudes, feelings, and relationships, and they see those things as evidence of goodness. Sometimes it's as simple as seeing that members of the healthcare team expect improvement and trust that it will happen. If doctors believe, so can children. For the children I talk to, faith isn't a capacity they develop. It's a gift from the ultimate itself the goodness at the heart of reality. Their spiritual practices express faith rather than promote it. They're a response to the gift, not a way to claim it. And they're a way of staying in relationship with goodness. There's a steady element of trust in the words kids use to talk about faith. Faith doesn't eliminate their trials or negative feelings. Children emphasize that they can be scared, angry, hopeless, and still have faith. God is here with us, says Leo, 15, a dialysis patient. If I die, I'm okay with God. My faith is that I have faith in God and he will help me with like transplant. He'll help my mom get the money for a kidney transplant. But what do Leo and others mean or know about this thing they call God? I met 15-year-old Enrique when he was sprawled in a chair at the transplant clinic with his thumbs dancing on a PlayStation controls playing uh, digital soccer. For a decade, doctors managed his kidney disease with medication. For most of childhood, he didn't think about being sick. He played with his cousins, he roughhoused on the basketball court, he volunteered at church, and he hung out with friends. But a year ago, his kidneys suddenly failed. Doctors told his parents to put him on the waiting list for a transplant. He'd need dialysis until a kidney became available. My mom signed me on Friday onto the transplant list, Enrique says. And then they called me on Saturday, the next day, just one day, and they gave me the transplant. It's like a second chance. Hope is like something like you have a feeling that you're going to accomplish something. They're going to give you something. They're going to give me a kidney, and I would not go on dialysis. Enrique says he wasn't surprised by the speed of the transplant because all of his life, something bigger than himself, his family, and his church has watched out for him. Sometimes you have a feeling like you're protected, he says. 
You're wondering that nothing bad is happening to you, like you have God or an angel or something. You get the feeling that something's protecting you and all that. And when you have that feeling, I think it was like God or something, an angel. Sometimes I feel it, and sometimes I just know. Children like Enrique don't just have faith. They express faith in something. They tend to call that something God, but they experience it through events in the world, through synchronicities, and a confidence that a power works for good on their behalf. It's a personal power, one that stays in relationship with them, communicates, and sometimes sends messengers like angels, ancestors, and physical sensations that provide comfort, consolation, and confidence. Above all, that power, God, hears and responds to their concerns. Everyone should be able to talk to Nick, or to God, says Nick, 17, the transplant recipient. They can talk to him right here. You may not have seen, or you may think he's not hearing me, but he hears all of us. He heals you too, physical, and he heals you in emotion. He heals you anytime in a way that you think you need. Children who attend to spirit talk about God in consistent ways. God is good. God hears their prayer. God listens to them. God can be felt and known through their bodies. God lives in them and acts on their behalf in the world. God watches over them. And God makes demands, asking them to participate in healing rather than waiting for God to do it all. He's like the voice in your head, Nick adds. He's the voice in your head that says, I'm going to make this happen. But in order for me to make that happen, you have to make this happen. So he told me, in order for you to get this kidney, you have to be patient and live your life as if you have two kidneys. And I did. I said, okay, I'm going to do that. This relationship, though, isn't all puppies and rainbows. Children trust God, and they also blame and rage at God. God becomes an intimate friend, the most intimate and trustworthy friend ever. They can be honest with God, and so they are. In fact, they say they must be honest with God, because God remains faithful to them no matter how they feel or what they say. This becomes important to children as they ask the types of difficult questions that haunt some suffering people. Why did I get sick? Why is this happening to me? Am I sick because I'm a bad person? Is the universe pushing me, punishing me, or teaching me a lesson? Why isn't treatment working? No one can resolve these spiritual and existential dilemmas, of course, at least not adequately or forever, but feeling safe and accepted enough to express these questions to God goes a long way toward helping sick children, and I would say sick adults, cope with physical, spiritual, and psychosocial suffering. 18-year-old Andrew, a transplant recipient, has had kidney disease since infancy. He says, when I had the kidney disease, before I was on dialysis, and even when I was, I used to, honestly, I used to blame God. I kept asking God, why can't I be like my friend, be healthy and not go through this and just not be on these meds and catheterizing all the time? I would tell myself that I was tired. God was punishing me, but I would never know why or what he was punishing me for. I would never know why. I thought he was punishing me because I had kidney disease, my grandma died, and then my sister died in the same year. I thought God was punishing me, taking the things I loved away. He was punishing me for something, and I just never knew what. Andrew shared this bitterness with his parents and with a church member. The church member prayed with him and suggested a Bible verse about Jesus casting away evil. And as Andrew reflected on the verse, things started to change. Being honest about the anger, he says, allowed God to respond to him through sacred text. And the verse helped him imagine how life would be when God took away the things that evil had put him through. It gave me more hope, Andrew says. 
God was giving me a brighter light to walk in. Since then, I got the transplant. 13-year-old Audrey, a Mormon, also gave God a piece of her mind. Her kidneys failed despite dialysis. She and her family prayed daily for donating a kidney, but when the kidney came, doctors canceled the transplant because of a problem with the donor's blood. I was totally frustrated, Audrey said. I got so angry. I got frustrated. It seems to me that nothing worked and God was not helping me. One day, her dad asked her why she was so mad. I told him that my kidneys weren't functioning. God is not helping, helping me. Her dad explained the transplant process and urged her to continue praying, especially for the person who would donate a kidney for her someday. A few weeks later, Audrey received a transplant. I thought it was not going to come true, she says, but it did come true. At first, I thought God didn't exist, but from that, he does exist. It did help me a lot, and he's blessed me a lot, and he's been taking care of me and being safe and healthy for my kidneys. What does she carry away from that experience? Believe and trust God, Audrey says. Believe and trust God. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I pray and trust, and that helps. Audrey's reliance on prayer reflects a third element of attending to spirit. Children with chronic illness use prayer to connect to goodness and to express and sustain their faith. For them, prayer, especially prayer with other children or other people, is the primary way they attend to spirit. They pray in community with members of their church, mosque, synagogue, or temple. They pray at home and over the phone with aunts and uncles and grandparents and siblings. They pray digitally with strangers, friends, and other kidney patients. They pray with religious leaders privately and in public. And they pray alone at night in their hospital beds. They pray about illness and they pray for others. Prayer comforts them, calms them, clarifies their feelings, and keeps them connected to spirit. It becomes a way of claiming power and influence in relation to the divine and to issues that transcend illness. Praying gives me hope to believe that God will bless you through the illness, says nine-year-old Maggie, a transplant recipient. Believe that God will bless you through it, no matter what happens. I pray before I eat and go to bed every day. I pray before I go to my classroom. God blesses me with the health issue I had, and he's going to bless other people with the issues they have. She especially prays with the donor of her transplanted kidney, an aunt who teaches her to attend to spirit in the midst of everyday life. But sustaining that attention isn't easy. Prayer slips away in the midst of busyness. An awareness of God can evaporate in the pain and stress of treatment. I have definitely felt more like of God's presence than I ever had before, says 14-year-old Riley, a dialysis patient. It's kind of like hard. It's hard to stay aware of God because I'm just like constantly like things are going on and it's really hard to like stay focused on God and like pray and go to church and stuff. But when I do have the time, it's just like, it's great because I really do like feeling him, you know? Like I've never felt him like that before. It's a knowing feeling, right? It's just like you know it in your head. You know that everything is going to be fine and you feel like everything is going to be fine in the end. After this, I'm going to, I really want to do something. Like I want to do something like counseling or I want to be a part of like make a wish foundation. I want to make a difference in people's lives and stuff. Prayer also involves clutching a rosary or fingering prayer beads during dialysis, volunteering to help others in and beyond the hospital, wearing religious jewelry, worshiping with others in community, reading sacred texts, singing gospel music, visiting prophets and fortune tellers and curanderas, and taking part in rituals. When 14-year-old Amber, for example, goes to the transplant clinic, she wears her grandfather's mother-of-pearl crucifix. 
When he died, Amber asked her grandmother for the necklace. And feeling the cross against her skin reminds her of her grandfather's strength during his own cancer treatment. He used to wear it when we were out with him and when I went to the doctor, Amber says. It reminds me to have faith. To me, hope is something like faith. Now, what these young people describe is what psychologists call spiritual and religious coping. Actions, feelings, thoughts, and relationships that help people make sense of life and deal with it in the context of the sacred. Any dimension of life recognized as carrying transcendent or divine meaning, a sense of connection. And it becomes a filter or lens for making sense of experience. People who use religion positively feel securely related to a transcendent force. They feel spiritually connected to others, and they see the world as a safe, benevolent place. They look for a strong connection to God, actively seek God's love and care, collaborate with God to put plans into action, identify how God strengthens them in particular situations, ask for forgiveness, and turn to spirituality to stop worrying about problems. People who engage in these activities have shown fewer psychosomatic symptoms in the present, and they show spiritual growth in the future. Negative religious coping, on the other hand, involves behaviors like wondering if God has abandoned you, feeling punished by God, questioning God's love, wondering whether your religious community has abandoned you, attributing events to the devil, and questioning the power of God. People who use religion in this way show increased psychological distress, poorer quality of life, and greater callousness toward other people. Children who nurture hope by attending to spirit demonstrate both positive and negative religious coping, usually both at once. <laughs> Andrew, for example, thought God was punishing him, negative coping, but turned to his religious community, prayer, sacred text, and meditation to overcome that limiting and harmful belief, positive coping. At, at its best, religious coping reduces anxiety, empowers people on dialysis, and increases a sick person's ability to care for themselves. Bringing spirituality into dialysis can reduce stress, improve quality of life, enhance sleep, reduce fatigue, and increase compliance with treatment. It can also improve spiritual wellness, enhance self-esteem, strengthen feelings of agency, and protect children from the effects of trauma. A lot of studies correlate spiritual well-being with a person's capacity to hope. 17-year-old Diamond grew up in a military family. The Navy moved her dad around a lot, and that meant changing schools every year or so. It was hard to make friends. Plus, her primary illness, the autoimmune disease, lupus nephritis, often kept her out of school, especially after it affected her kidneys. Diamond felt isolated most of her life. Lupus can cause kidney problems, and Diamond had three particular risk factors. She was young, black, and female. Her kidneys failed by the time she turned 12. Doctors removed them, and Diamond started dialysis. But surgery led to an infection. The infection led to a seizure, and the seizure left her non-responsive for weeks. She spent three months in the hospital. And the whole time she was unconscious, her aunts and grandmother made sure at least one person prayed beside her bed around the clock. Diamond says faith and prayer sustain her hope, that and knowing God will never abandon her. You have to have faith that God does stuff for reasons, she says. He takes you through things so you can be a testimony to somebody else. You get through whatever you're going through. You can tell people how like people are going through something similar or the same thing. You can tell them how you got through it and how you can work it out and how you work it out. You can try to make their trial more easier than what you've been through. She says attending to spirit isn't easy, but it's necessary. It gets hard a lot to keep your faith because it's hard to deal with, Diamond says, but you just got to pray about it. I do lose my faith sometimes, but I have family that helps me get through it. When Diamond feels faith slipping or God seems distant, 
she prays for a stronger connection and stronger belief. She learned to pray from her oldest auntie, who taught her when she was a child, and now Diamond prays several times a day, silently when alone and out loud in person or over the phone with her aunties, grandmother, and church members. Prayer reminds Diamond that God wants her to be a testimony to others. It gives her suffering purpose. God put everybody here for a reason, she says. When he put you here for a reason, he wants you to do it, because that shows a meaning in life. Everybody has their own feeling of what hope is, because people go through different things. Some people let their illness get them down, like I do sometimes. They just seem depressed. They seem like a, they have a cloud over their head. But these hopeful kids, they do not let their illness get through. They talk to other people their age. They're active, energetic. Just, they feel good inside. Diamond's story points toward consistent, positive religious coping. She collaborates with God, connects to others, seeks divine love and care, feels communion with transcendence, and finds purpose in her experience. Her story also illustrates a hallmark result of attending to spirit, turning inward to access spiritual realities and resources, leads sick children outward again with an expanded perspective. In turning to spirit, they also to, tend also to slowly look beyond themselves, the treatment room, and personal concerns to engage the world and the concerns of others. In the beginning, sick children focus on outer resources, seeking personal health and comfort from people and activities around them. They strengthen their sense of agency and influence in relation to the treatment team and the illness. But as they experience the unpredictable and uncontrollable nature of chronic illness, they realize their lives will never be normal in the ways they desire, no matter what they or others do. Human power cannot domesticate kidney disease. And this realization causes many children with chronic illness to seek spiritual power as an ally. Seeking consolation beyond the human, they grasp that goodness loves and values them whether or not they're normal by their standards or the standards of the world. This insight turns them outward again with a new sense of compassion and empathy. They pivot beyond themselves and beyond the transplant unit or dialysis unit to offer their gifts to the world by giving care and support to others. Purpose sustains hope, and children discover purpose in part by attending to spirit. Because of the disease, says 15-year-old Leo, you learn things to use to help other people who are sick. Leo's insight points toward the relational dimension of chronic illness. Hope, for the children who talked with me, isn't a feeling or a virtue or an individual resource. It's a shared asset, deeply entangled in connection to others, an ability to influence relationships, and a nascent awareness that goodness expects them to participate in and contribute to the flourishing of others. I understand it this way. Attending to spirit creates contemplative space in which sick children can attend to, identify, and claim how illness equips them to benefit others. By placing their personal illness in a broader, transcendent context, they claim a sense of vocation shaped largely by the landscape of illness, a compassionate, altruistic commitment to easing the burden of sick people and of those who are temporarily well, which includes all of us. Learning to attend to spirit is itself a product of relationships and altruistic commitments. Many sick children talk about a wisdom figure, a grandparent, an aunt, a pastor, a hospital chaplain, or a family friend who taught them faith and coached them in attending to spirit. These are people present in the midst of illness not to attend to the details of treatment or pay the bills or worry about transportation, but just to be with sick children taking time to listen, to encourage, and to introduce children to spirit in behavioral ways by teaching them to pray, to rely on scripture, to trust the goodness of the world. Wisdom figures offer guidance, presence, and consolation to children 
usually through relationships that begin long before diagnosis. They model for sick children how to make positive spiritual or religious sense of pain and suffering. They help children understand partnership, uh, faith as a partnership not only between people and God, but also between people and people and broader communities. Congregations and other spiritual communities mediate the consolation of spirit by visiting children in the hospital, sending them gifts and cards, or emailing them to check in and offer encouragement. Wisdom figures matter because children initially trust goodness because other older people trust it too. Sick children trust their own ability to cope with illness because others voice confidence that children can cope with the help of God. In the end, children have faith not only in God, but also in the people around them. Relationships with wisdom figures mirror, model, and create the faith and trust that children place in God. So what do I take away from all of this? Three things. First, children know that hope can exceed human capacities, drawing from powers and realities beyond yet glimpsed through the material world. The transpersonal dimension of hope also reveals something about humanity. We are larger than our material biological bodies. We're embedded in a matrix of relationships and energies that exceeds awareness. These relationships and energies call us to a purpose beyond ourselves and bigger than our egos. We not only create identity, power, and meaning through action, but receive them from sources larger than our personalities and communities. Hope and humanity need imagination, intuition, and transcendent intimacy. Children seem more aware than adults sometimes of the transpersonal aspects of hopefulness and meaning that sustain human thought, action, and relationship. Second, spirit, spirituality, and religion matter tremendously in the midst of chronic illness. Kenneth Doka, who is an expert on death, dying, and bereavement, says that chronic life-threatening illness is at its heart a fundamentally spiritual crisis. It's a time when people are focused on making meaning, finding hope, and facing death. Chil chronically ill children sustain hope in part by attending to spirit when human power proves insufficient. I am puzzled that contemporary psychological, philosophical, and educational conversations about hope pay such little attention to spirituality. This illustrates the importance of paying attention to the voices and experiences of children in understanding what hope is and how it manifests in people's lives. Third, the children who talk with me suggest that the practice of attending to spirit manifests primarily through relational avenues and through an open, receptive, reflective attitude that's activated through religious and spiritual practices like prayer, worship, visitation, blessing, reading of scripture, wisdom figures, and material religion that is, objects, rituals, communities, and practices, matter a lot to children. While they often attend to spirit for instrumental reasons, making it a means to an end, such as using prayer to manage anxiety during a medical procedure, they also emphasize its personal and communal significance. They speak intimately and personally of God's availability and presence in the midst of illness. Attending to that presence assures them of the goodness of life and the benevolence of the world. It keeps them connected to important relationships with people living and dead, nearby and at a distance. It gives them a sense of agency, and it turns their attention outward to something larger than kidney disease. I've learned from children that attending to spirit involves learning from practicing with and valuing others in formal and informal spiritual communities. Adults need to help children learn to attend to spirit, equipping them with the knowledge and skills it requires and encouraging relationships with wisdom figures. Consolation comes through spirit, but usually clothed in human skin. We receive divine consolation through the people in our lives. And children know spirit first through relationships with family, friends, and caregivers. 
understanding who God is and how God acts assures sick children that ultimately the world can be trusted, that God is good, present, active, and works on their behalf, allows children to choose trust in the midst of pain, suffering, and ambiguity. It nurtures a sense of abundance, a confidence that they will get what they need even when they and their families cannot provide it themselves. Knowing that they are loved and valued even when they can't be normal in the ways they yearn allows children to claim the gifts and wisdom that emerge from their experiences of illness. Thank you all for listening so closely. You've been attentive and uh, we appreciate you giving your selves to the voices of these children who have so much to teach us. I think at this point, uh, Dr. Music, we're open for questions and conversation. Uh, are you going to moderate or? Yes. Um, thank you. First of all, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bidwell. That was uh, a marvelous talk. Um, very powerful. In fact, uh, early on, um, one of uh, the audience members said such powerful words and deeply moving, which I think has mm. uh, been maintained throughout the whole talk. So thank you very much for that. Um, we can take questions in two ways. You could simply uh, raise your hand, uh, ideally with the um, uh, the reactions, uh, if you could raise your hand there, or if you don't have audio, or if you prefer, you could type in your question to the chat. And um, I have a, a colleague here who will, uh, George will read out to anything typed in the chat. So uh, would anyone like to start with a question? Uh, yes, Nick, please. Yeah. Um, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. That was sure. I really appreciate that. Um, I was just curious. Have you noticed any children who are not from from atheistic background? Their families don't believe in any kind of higher power, and does that affect them adversely? Yeah, I I um, I didn't have any children tell me that they are atheist or that their family. Um, are atheists, uh, but there are children who didn't mention um, this practice, right? Um, does that affect them adversely? I don't know. My hunch is that these five practices, the more of them that are activated in a child's life, the more hopeful the child is. So that uh, if you have a child who has the other four practices going, but they don't have attending to spirit, it makes sense to ask questions or to coach them into talking about uh, meaning and the transcendent um, in ways that may benefit them. But I also trust children to know what they need in any given moment. So when a child didn't talk about attending to spirit, I, I tended to trust that that just wasn't a part of hope for them at that point in their lives, right? It's not an all or nothing thing. It's uh, to some degree or another in different seasons uh, of our lives. So thanks for the question, Nick. Eric, please. Yeah. Thank you, Duane, for sharing those uh, powerful testimonies. I, I found myself moving to tears several times through your talk. I don't, I don't know how... Uh, you were able to do it. <laughs> but, uh, um, I share a bit with you the reason why I was eager to hear your, uh, your words today. I've been in a wheelchair since a car accident when I was 15 years old. So um, one of the questions that came to mind was, as these children began their practice of attending to spirit, uh, in in the midst of the trauma they were going through. Um, I'm wondering if there's any research as to when they've grown up and how that effect of attending the spirit in their youth affected the way they attend the spirit in their adulthood. Yeah, I haven't seen that research. And one of the reasons is that children with end-stage renal disease tend to have uh, what we would think of as short lives. Um, a child who begins dialysis uh, in grade school will have the cardiovascular system of an 80-year-old by the time she's uh, an adult and all of the problems that come with that. So end-stage renal disease um, tends to be a disease that really truncates the future. 
which is one of the reasons I wanted to talk to sick children. Um, so much of adult hope theory focuses on it being a future-oriented construct. Uh, but what does it mean if a person doesn't have much of a future or doesn't have the developmental skills to imagine a future? So I'm sorry I can't answer your question, um, but I think it's a good one for somebody to take up. So when you're ready to do doctoral work, let me know. Others? Okay, yeah. I'm unmuted oh. now. Okay. What, uh, what struck me in your, your talk, uh, Dr. Bidwell, was um, I, I've, I've worked in the addiction field for many years, and uh, the 12 step program has had a profound effect on my own life. I, I'm not a recovered uh, alcoholic or addict or anything, but uh, I recover from many things <laughs> besides that. Um, th their second step says, came to believe that a power greater than ourself could restore us to sanity. And sanity is understood that even in their program, healthy living. Yes. Healthy living. And that's what I'm hearing from you uh, today came to believe, these children came to believe that a power greater than themselves could restore them. Could, yes. not only could, but did restore them. Yes. That's what I heard from you today. Thank you. And restoration doesn't mean being healed of the illness, right? Oh. It means learning to live well with all, live all well. of that suffering. And, and for me, that's important because as I gave as an aside, all of us are only temporarily well, right? We're all going to suffer in some way, maybe not with kidney disease, but we're going to see our bodies betray us like these children's bodies have. And their ability to learn to live well, to accept that they'll never be the things they want to be, but there are gifts that come from the illness that make them uh, a gift to the world. It's really important. So thank you very much for your comment. There, one last, there's an ancient text that I read here, ancient, going back to third, fourth century, said that, that the glory of God is a person who is fully alive. Yes. The glory of God is a person who is fully alive. Yep. And the second part of the text was pointed out to me, is that the one who is fully alive has seen God. Uh-huh. I'll leave it with you, but those are powerful statements for me. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, if I could jump in, actually, uh, sure. with a question. Um, towards the end of your talk and your summary, Dr. Bidwell, you mentioned that there is a resistance to um, look towards what you're finding in this idea of attending spirit and in childhood hope in uh, studies that uh, are medical studies or psychoanalysis or psychiatry, I guess. Mm -hmm. do, do you have a, a particular um, assessment of why there is resistance? I know this is probably part of, part of a larger question, but why, why is there resistance to the material that you are finding? Um, mm -hmm in uh, studies, larger studies, medical studies on hope? Um, I, I don't know if I would call it resistance. It might simply be not being aware. <laughs> um, I, I think there are lots of things going on. One is that it's uncomfortable to sit with suffering kids and ask them these kinds of questions and to take them seriously when you, we all get caught in our disciplinary silos, right? So if I'm a psychologist, I ask psychological questions and the theological existential questions may not be a part of that. If I'm a physician, I look at uh, biomedical uh, issues and I ask about that. So I, I think it is partly um, blinders people have on blinders partly is it's unnerving to talk to children about these things we you know in north atlantic cultures we tend to think of children in two ways they're either little devils who need to be corrected or they're innocents who need to be protected 
when in fact they are agents who have power and experience and wisdom that we can learn from. And one of the reasons we learn from them is they don't have the adult language to talk about what they're experiencing. So they have to express it in a way that shifts our perspective, right? So we're not used to teaching, uh, treating children as um, agents who can teach us something, usually, right? Um, another is that um, I, I think there is such a positivist bent um, around documenting things we can measure, things we can see, things we can touch. And spirituality and spiritual life tend not to be that way. Although all of that literature on religious coping, positive and negative, is psychosocial literature, right? They've found ways to operationalize those concepts, but they don't engage the particulars of one person's experience around those things. But there's lots of literature on the spirituality of children. So if you're interested, there's, there's a lot you could engage there. Thanks. If I could just quickly follow up too, I think you also indicated because there's such a network too, I think of support that you have observed that helps yes. explain, you know, this, uh, the power of attending to spirit and how that is a very practical and helpful guide to, I guess, uh, well, well, supporting people who are ill unwell um and that is that is that really defined in other studies it's coming through in in your study on childhood Ill, illness but is that something that's focused uh within the adult uh experience it it does come across to some extent uh, but it also depends on the unit of analysis right so uh some people may study just individuals so they don't ask about the relationships or look at the networks. It became clear to me very early in dialysis units that the entire family has the illness, not just the child. That the illness affects everyone within that child's um, orbit. So I started paying attention to how they interacted with parents and with doctors and with others to try and get a sense for um, how they felt supported, but also children talk about hope coming through other people. I'm remembering uh, a, a girl who uh, was an undocumented um, Mexican immigrant. She needed a kidney transplant in the United States. You can't get a kidney transplant unless if you're not documented, unless you have the cash to pay for it. Um, and when I asked her to tell me a story about hope, she said, uh, hope is every night when my mommy and my grandma and my brothers and I hold hands around the dinner table and give thanks and then share a meal, right? That very concrete example of how important those relationships were to her. Children don't take talk about hope in big, gigantic, cinematic, um, bright colors. They talk about tiny little things, playing video games with my friends having dinner with my family, having an aunt who sat next to my bed uh, while I was in surgery, those kinds of things. Yeah. I think there's a lot we could do around research with kids, um, not just kids, but others, and how our spiritual lives are so connected to relationship. Thank you. Sure. Are there other questions or observations anybody would like to add? How many people in the room um, know yeah. someone with kidney disease or uh, have experienced kidney kidney disease? Okay, a couple. I think uh, Dean Shrivastava has her hand up, but is muted. Okay. Oh, there um, a couple of uh, questions too just came up in the chat and. Then and then we'll go to, oops, can you turn that off? There's a, there's a, a question in the chat, and then we'll go okay. to these attendants. Okay, so the question in the chat is from Aaron. Have you ever seen a parent lose hope? 
George, I'm going to ask you to mute yourself. I think we may be getting some feedback. Thank you. Have you ever seen a parent lose hope? And did that have a negative impact on the child? Is there a way for parents to avoid that? Uh, yes, I have seen children or parents lose hope. Um, it can negatively affect a child in the moment. But what's uh, really important is to not, I, I think, not to protect a child from the moments we as adults lose hope, but to show them how we recover it, to teach them that resiliency, that the bad moments don't last forever. So um, I, when parents lose hope, it tends to be uh, in the presence of a doctor uh, with bad news, and um, it's a crisis moment. But I haven't, I did not encounter any parents who were just completely hopeless about what was going on with their kid. Um, and uh, it is important. So when I said um, experience with a wisdom figure makes kids more resilient in the face of trauma and violence, that's from a study of uh, children in Israel and Palestine. And what they found is that the children who reported having an adult who modeled faith and using faith and spirituality to cope positively with violence had better outcomes than children who didn't have that. So I think it's not a case of a, a parent losing faith, but um, refusing to show a child how to continue to cope in the midst of that kind of crisis that could cause problems. Be a great study for somebody. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Shreba Asta, please, you have a comment, I think. Yeah. Aruna? Oh, so yeah. sorry. Um, so I'm, I'm, thank you very much for, um, for this uh, talk. Um, as as Carolyn mentioned, I'm. It's this is part of the work that I'm doing as a new associate dean in the faculty of arts, and and, um, and so I've been thinking a lot about about religious pluralism from, from in especially doing um, listening to this talk. Um, I have been someone who's lived with various chronic illnesses since I was a very young child. Um, and though um, one of those is type one diabetes where um, I'm looking forward to adult dialysis. Um, another is a, a, a form of um, epilepsy. Um, and uh, that, that those were the, the uh, that is the illness I've had since I was a child. And um, now I do a lot of work on um, equity, diversity, inclusion in the context of accessibility for those of us who, who have, have had chronic illnesses mm -hmm. um, all of our lives, but there, they may not be that um, visible, even if we go into the hospital, as I just did yesterday, um, there, there's no, there's nothing visible um, about that. So that's what my research. I'm, I'm in the Department of English and Indigenous Studies here. Um, but one of the one of the things that really interests me, because I I don't think a lot about hope, but I think that's because of my. Um, my religious background is not a theist one. Mm -hmm. And so I, 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 I think that I, I have learned through my family and friends and so forth, I've learned a different way of articulating hope. So yes. it wouldn't be through God. It would, it would be, it would be through relationship. Um, and, and the, the, the folks, um, the folks, both uh, familial and friends, but also the medical people and so forth, yeah. who, who've done well, who saved my life and those of the um, many, many people in my family who who have um, 
all of us have a, another illness that um, it has started to kill us as we get older. And so I'm thinking about that because I don't want to sound like a, in my first visit with, with people, like a, a, a snarky atheist. Um, but I would certainly say that I was not raised as a, was not raised as a theist. And so I'm thinking about, you know, uh, I think of myself as a deeply spiritual person right. um, and wonder whether I was as a, a little one when there were points in my life um, where it wasn't clear whether I was going to survive certain certain illnesses. I have, um, but in, in at that time, it, it, we weren't sure about that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and that's true of all of my family, um, all of the children in my family, um, who are now all almost seniors. So, um, and two or three of my uh, siblings have died from these illnesses. So I think, um, I don't have a real question that doesn't to me sound um, rude almost, but like how, how, how do we talk about these children with chronic illnesses and the ways that I think they really deeply can teach us about spirit and hope, but without, um, especially maybe for the families they're in or the connections they have with, without talking about um, notions of theism or, mm -hmm. or God, because I think we can, we as old, like former children probably can, can um, function in the same ways and have a lot to teach adults about yes. hope and spirit. That's what I'm trying to say in a really long way. Yes. Um, and, and those are great questions because um, theism is on the decrease in North Atlantic settings, right? And um, I, I don't, I, I, these children talked about God and I adopted their language, but not all children talk about God, but they still talk about relationships. They still talk about a sense of purpose and vocation. They still talk about um, a sense of comfort and consolation that comes through nature or through other things. So it is it is less important to me that we use language of spirit or God uh, than it is that we let children express those kinds of existential value-laden um, experiences. Um, and, and, you know, one of the interview questions was simply, tell me a story about a time you you felt hope come. Um, and, and that is a really generative question for people. Um, and uh, I think it's often a place to start when you don't know someone's religious background or um, their beliefs uh, is to simply say, tell me, tell me about your experiences of hope. When did you feel most hopeful? Uh, who was around? Where was that? Uh, what difference did it make to you? Um, and I'm remembering a, an older man, um, I mean, this is aside from the study, right? He, he was an atheist, uh, and um, he insisted to me that experiences of God were simply hormone cascades in the human body, and, um, and that was fine. But he went on a trip to South America, and he went to a volcano uh, where um, there's this environment that creates huge giant plants. I can't forget, I can't remember what it's called, but anyway, he came back and he talked about how much it had changed him to be a small human being in the presence of these giant things and how it taught him about there is an undercurrent of peace and connection in the world, right? So he was talking about spirituality he would never call it that. And I didn't cynically say, so your hormones really, yeah, you know, um, uh, but you, you just ask people to talk about those experiences and use their language, privilege their language. Yeah. Uh, could I just come in, uh, comment uh, that uh, resonates with, with the discussion right now? Um, 
how do we create slash craft spaces for the inner wisdom of the child to shine? Um, yes. Jacob, please. Jacob, you had a hand up. Jacob, yeah. yeah. Do you have a, do you Hello. Hi. Yes. Uh, I, I hope you don't, Aruna, I hope you don't mind me offering uh, a thought alongside what you were saying. Uh, I, I can, I am a Christian. I spend a lot of time speaking with other Christians, not only in my tradition, but in others. We all know, and I'm sure you also know, there are hundreds of denominations, many of them specializing in their particular uh, angle on the truth available for the whole world, which I think continues to also raise atheists when they have to listen to this. But I do find that this presentation by Dr. Bidwell, uh, I'm already thinking I must share it with my faith community because we have such a tendency in this modern day within our faith communities to talk about politics and the behavior of our children and relationships with one another. We do a lot of problem solving without any reference to God. And I am just so touched right now. I, I want to share it with a lot of fellow Christians because there is like something here to learn from uh, children who are ill. Uh, sometimes we're very afraid of people who are ill and there is something very fresh and enlightening to me, it's an experience of God, but I'm just ready to say that's for myself and maybe others experience it slightly differently. But it's an encouragement for those of us who thought we believed for a long time. Thank you, Jacob. I'm, I'm glad the, the work encourages yeah. you. Um, Sally. Oh. Sorry. Go Sorry. ahead, Sarah. Go ahead, Dr. Bidwell. Sorry. Yeah, oh, was... so doc, uh, thank you. Um, I think you probably answered this question in your presentation, but I'm just going to ask my question anyway, and you can reiterate it <laughs> if you did. Um, but my, uh, because my wondering is, you know, when we use the word hope, you know, what, what do we actually mean? You know, and I think, I think the easy equation is that hope is somehow the belief that things will be better. I guess maybe that, you know, and is that, that feels like such a small definition of hope. I don't know. So I'm just curious, you know, how you would, what, what you would say to that. Thank you. Sure. Um, I, I don't I don't know that I answered that because part of the genesis of this research was to say um, if adults, researchers mostly have defined hopes in ways that exclude children or exclude um, people with um, uh, who lack executive functioning skills or who uh, have chronic illness and therefore can't have some of the um, uh, the cognitive uh, capacities that uh, these researchers say are inherent to hope, um, then what do children say hope is, right? If we base all of our understanding on adult uh, perception, um, we, we might miss something. So my part of what drove my question was, what do children know about hope that we've forgotten? What do they know about being human that we've forgotten? And so much of the literature wants to paint hope as about um, a cognitive process of setting goals and enhancing agency to reach goals and uh, 
um, um, being able to make to regal if we can't make it to the goal we have. That I, I really was curious that, um, thank you, Dr. Logan, uh, do children talk about hope in goal-oriented ways? Well, they do and they don't. Sometimes they do, but more often they talk about this web of relationship that we're woven into. And so for me, the question has been, uh, where and with whom does hope make itself known to you? And what is it that motivates you to keep going and gives you a sense that you belong and that you make a difference here? Um, where do you have a sense that you have access to resources to make progress toward the things you want to achieve? Um, even if those aren't huge things, right? Even if it's something small, like uh, going on a picnic. Um, so I know I'm not answering your question specifically. You're asking me for a definition of hope. And uh, partly what I'm trying to say is, I think hope has as many definitions as it has people. Yeah. And it has these local rhythms and flavors and scents. We dance to the drumbeat of hope, uh, but we hear those drumbeats in different ways. And it is something that quickens the human spirit and, and gives it the confidence to trust that the world is a good place. And that despite the suffering and harm we see, in the end, uh, we're still okay. So um, I, I know that's not satisfactory, uh, if I had to operationalize it, um, I would tend to talk about hope being uh, the sense that I have access to the resources I need to achieve uh, good ends in the world, right? Um, and it, it's closely connected to values. One of the other issues with hope research is that it it tries to be amoral, right? It's, it's, it says hope... Hope is not about um, a particular virtue or uh, a value system or ethic. It's about making progress toward what you want. Well, I, I have real problems with that because not all goals are hopeful, right? So for me, it has to be contributing. Uh, contrib what can I do to lessen the suffering in the world and help create more abundant life? What allows me to keep working to that direction? Those are the sources of my hope, right? Mm -hmm. Well, so I hear your definition of hope as being around um, an experience of positive aliveness. I feel, yes. I feel alive. I feel connected. I feel part of things. I feel like I can, I have some choices I can make, even if there are some I don't get to make. There are some ways I can be creatively part of my world, even if it's not all the ways I would wish and the capacity to be, to, to, be active in that respect. Yes. Because I can think that people could die hopeful. Yes. Right? If they are alive and connected and and valuing the people that are around their bedside yes. or whatever, they're not dying in a ho hopeless place. So like right. death and hope are not like antithetical to one another. No. Yeah. And neither are, are uh, hope and despair. They can coexist okay. at the same time, right? Uh, because there are things to despair about, but you can still be hopeful in the midst of your despair. It, uh, so uh, uh, this is a lecture on Christian spirituality, right? So let me put on my Christian theologian hat a little bit and say, in the Christian traditions, we have tended to, um, uh, Eric, well, I'm looking, Eric wrote, hope is not institutional, it's contextual and relational. It's a living presence and not a defined objective. Thank you. That's, that's beautiful. And Kelly, I have not lost your question. Um, in Christian traditions, the doctrine of eschatology or the last things has been so closely associated with hope. And the church has adopted a temporal or chron chronological understanding of that primarily, right? That our hope is at the end of time. Our hope is when everything comes to fruition. But there's a subjugated tradition uh, in the Christian world uh, called topological hope, where does hope emerge? Where does the 
uh, commonwealth of God uh, come to fruition with whom what creates the conditions for someone to experience that. And in many ways, what children tell us is that topological hope or hope that is connected to context is far more alive and important to them than chronological hope, right? It is about what creates, what allows me to glimpse the fullness of life, the fullness of uh, the abundance of um, what it means to be human and in relationship with these people here and now much more than it is, will I get a kidney <laughs> uh, transplant and be able to stop dialysis? They might hope to get a kidney, but in the end, a kidney doesn't end uh, the things that they struggle with the way their relationships do. So I would say we need to recover, as in Christian communities, we need to recover that topological sense of eschatology, that topological sense of hope. Uh, where is it now? Where do we sense it, taste it, smell it, feel it, touch it? Yeah. Kelly asked in the chat, how do we create or craft spaces for the inner wisdom of the child to shine? Uh, this is a great question. And um, we don't have time to answer it fully, but I would say, hi, Kelly, uh, it's good to see you. Um, it is partly about cultivating our own sense of wonder and curiosity that we have to pare away the things we think we know as adults in order to let children express their inner wisdom or receive their inner wisdom. Nature is a place where that often happens. On a congregational life, a godly play, the curriculum godly play is another place it happens because it teaches children to, you know, th those questions, I wonder, is the pedagogical tool it uses. You always begin everything with kids by saying, I wonder about this. And it invites them to wonder with you. And then you get these glimpses into incredibly rich understandings and lives that you wouldn't have gotten if you had tried to say, uh, here's what the text means. <laughs> um, so children who are overprogrammed, who are taught that relationships are instrumental, um, who um, only have transactional interactions with people in their lives, um, don't get to, to grow inner wisdom the way children do who have space for their imaginations to run and uh, who have adults who are with them simply because they enjoy being with this child. And we can't enjoy every child all the time, right? But overall, uh, we, we wonder at that. So I hope that gets at the question you were asking. Yeah, thanks. Well, this has been a wonderful discussion. And I think you have led us into this assessment of what hope is and how we can talk about it um, uh, in so many different ways, uh, whether um, mentioning the name God or not. There are, there are, there are models and uh, I guess aspirations that are found in your research that are, are humbling really, I guess, learning, um, learning from these children. And uh, I think Eric really does sum this up so so well, you know, the context, but the relational, um, the relational and how that enables a sense of uh, purpose and, and hope in, in one another. So, and, and I think that does tie in with the theme as well with our Interfaith Harmony mm -hmm. Week, um, maybe not so much the stranger bit, but the neighbors bit. Um, in relation to the uh, to to uh, the community and relying on one another, but I think we will stop there. Uh, you have given us so much insight, and your your study is so amazing, and we look forward to its publication. You have, must keep us posted on the publication of your work. Spring and of twenty four. Okay. Spring 24 from Beacon. Okay. Yeah. Hope springs eternal. That's right. <laughs> and, um, and so please, everyone, uh, join me in thanking Dr. Bidwell once again. Thank you. Thank you. I just. I so appreciate.